These are Interventional Radiology Board Review Cases, and this is Group 2. What's your best diagnosis? The best diagnosis in this case is May Turner syndrome, also known as iliac vein compression syndrome. Name a clinical presentation of May Turner. Two common clinical presentations of May Turner are leg swelling and DVT. Treatment options for May Turner syndrome include The correct answer is D. Treatment options include division of the right common iliac artery and relocation behind the left common iliac vein or endovascular stenting. True or false, balloon expandable stents are preferred for endovascular treatment of May Turner syndrome. The answer is false. Self-expanding rather than balloon expandable stents are preferred. A self-expanding stent can re-expand if intermittently squashed by the right common iliac artery. A balloon expandable stent, if intermittently squashed by the right common iliac artery, may remain deformed. That said, balloon expandable stents can be used if dilation and contouring with a self-expanding stent is insufficient. Which of the following hormone ratios is used to confirm satisfactory adrenal vein sampling? The correct answer is C. We can confirm if a blood sample came from an adrenal vein by comparing its cortisol concentration against the cortisol concentration coming from a peripheral vein sample. If the blood sample is truly an adrenal vein sample, its cortisol concentration should be at least 10 times higher than the cortisol concentration in a peripheral venous sample. Which of the following is true in this case? The correct answer is C, increased right adrenal aldosterone production. The laterality of aldosterone hyperproduction is assessed by comparing the aldosterone to cortisol ratio between the adrenal and peripheral venous samples. Aldosterone hyperproducing adrenal glands will demonstrate ratios higher than that of the peripheral vein, as with the right adrenal venous sample in this case, which is 20 times compared to 2x in the peripheral vein. Commitment, concomitant suppression of contralateral adrenal aldosterone production is an associated finding, which is why the aldosterone to cortisol ratio is less than one in the left adrenal vein sample here. Some take-home points. Cholangiocarcinoma and sclerosing cholangitis can be distinguished on cholangiography based upon and the best answer is D, none of the above. On this um, percutaneous transhepatic cholangiogram here, we have dilated intrahepatic ducts secondary to a common hepatic duct stricture, which was decompressed via insertion of an external internal percutaneous biliary drain. Which percutaneous biliary drainage approach is associated with the highest risk of transpleural complication? The answer is a right intercostal access. List at least three indications for percutaneous biliary drainage.
Indications for percutaneous biliary drainage include tumor, stone, biliary stricture, sludge within the biliary duct, or biliary clot. In what sort of patients is percutaneous biliary drainage generally preferred over ERCP? And those are patients with a ruin Y anastomosis. An angiogram was then shot on the left side with the foot in plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. What is your best diagnosis? The best diagnosis in this case is popliteal artery entrapment. On the other side, we see there's stenosis and focal medial deviation of the left popliteal artery just above the knee on dorsiflexion. Manifestations of popliteal artery entrapment include all except The correct answer here is standing waves. Manifestations of popliteal artery entrapment include emboli, aneurysm, and narrowing. What is the preferred TPA dose should arterial lysis be attempted in this case? And the dose would be one milligram per hour. Which statement regarding microwave ablation of lung tumors is true? True statement here is D. Microwave ablation is in the lung may be faster than RFA or cryoablation. Microwave ablation can generally provide predictable and large ablation zones even in um, aerated lung. The advantage of faster treatment is true. Microwave ablation times are typically shorter, um, two to five minutes on average, as opposed to say 12 to 15 minutes for a similar size treatment area of other modalities. And the energy propagates directly through air and tissue. And so the high intrinsic impedance of lung tissue is therefore not a barrier to um, effective treatment. What is the inheritance pattern of the syndrome associated with this disorder? The answer here is autosomal dominant. Hereditary hemorrhagic T-line ectasia, or HHT, is the syndrome we're referring to in this case, and is associated with an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. What percent of HHT patients with pulmonary AVMs may also have an AVM in their head? The answer is 10%. Which of the following may be a reason for emergent percutaneous nephrostomy? The emergent indication amongst these choices is hypotension, which would be suspicious for urosepsis in this patient with a UPJ obstruction. Which of the following is true regarding percutaneous nephrostomy via an upper pole calyx? So the answer is B, higher risk for pneumothorax. Ureteral stone extraction is easier with an upper pole approach since your approach to the ureter is more inline and direct. But because of the increased risk of traversing the pleural space, the risk for both pneumothorax and urothorax are higher.
What's your best diagnosis? The best diagnosis here is a large SMA pseudoaneurysm. After the abdominal aorta, which artery is most likely to be affected by a mycotic aneurysm? And that would be the superior mesenteric artery. Which of the following is associated with giant visceral arterial pseudoaneurysms? Any of the conditions on this list, pancreatitis, trauma, infection, can be associated with giant visceral arterial pseudoaneurysms. These are images of a 20-year-old medical student. Which of the following is the most likely cause of these findings in a 20-year-old medical student? The answer is ergot poisoning in this patient with long segment stenoses of the right external iliac artery and both superficial femoral arteries. Treatment of ergot poisoning includes which of the following? And the answer here is C, um, removing the ergot exposure. Um, sometimes treatment can also involve vasodilators. Ergot use is associated with which of the following disorders? Ergot use is associated with all of the above, acroosteolysis, vascular stenosis, and gynecomastia. One key point is the third um, line here. Um, it's generally um, very uncommon to encounter Berger's disease above the knee. Which of the following statements about pinch off syndrome is false? The false statement here is B, tip of removed catheter is beveled. When you remove the chest port and the catheter connected to the port, a beveled end, which is how we're trained to cut chest port catheters, would suggest that the catheter end was a surgical cut rather than a catheter fracture site due to repetitive stress. The other statements here um, in this question are otherwise true. Regarding removal of the catheter fragment, All of the above are true. Depending on if the fragment is upstream or downstream from the heart, removal may or may not be emergent due to the risk of cardiac arrhythmia. Any retained foreign body is a potential risk factor for infection. What is the one-year primary patency rate of stent graft tips? One-year primary patency rate of stent graft tips is around 85%. What is the primary patency of a tips with the timeline shown here? The primary patency of this TIPS is four months. What is the primary assisted patency of a TIPS with this timeline here? The primary assisted patency of this TIPS is six months. What is the secondary patency of a TIPS with this timeline?
The secondary patency of this TIPS is seven months. Which statement best describes portosystemic collaterals in portal venous hypertension? The correct answer is D. Bleeding from ectopic varices is uncommon, accounting for less than 5% of all cases of variceal bleeding. Ectopic varices are varices outside of the gastroesophageal region. Statement D is true and statement C is false. The other two statements are false. Lower esophageal varices are from left gastric vein and short gastric veins to distal esophageal veins to the azygous vein. Flow proceeds from the IMV to the superior rectal vein to the middle and inferior rectal veins. So in this series of angiograms performed across a TIPS, we see multiple pelvic and hemorrhoidal varices filling via an umbilical vein. All right, next question. An advantage of using covered stent grafts versus TIPS place for TIPS placement to treat refractory ascites is And the advantage of using covered stent grafts for TIPS is a reduced liver parenchymal ingrowth and bile deposition, improving shunt patency. Using a covered stent does not eliminate the possibility of hepatic encephalopathy post-TIPS and still involves ultrasound surveillance and portosystemic gradient measurements. Describe three portosystemic collateral pathways. Let's review these um, several portosystemic venous collateral pathways. Portal venous blood can decompress into the azygous vein via the left and short gastric veins and distal esophageal veins. Portal venous blood can also decompress into the external iliac vein via the periumbilical vein and epigastric veins. Portal venous blood can also decompress into the internal iliac vein via the IMV, superior rectal veins, and middle and inferior rectal veins. What's your best diagnosis? This is a case of effort-induced venous thrombosis. Which of the following is not a symptom or sign of effort-induced venous thrombosis? The answer here is B, arm atrophy. Symptoms and signs of effort-induced venous thrombosis include arm swelling, arm blueness, arm redness, and sudden onset of pain. This disorder may involve which vessels? Effort-induced venous thrombosis can involve the external jugular vein, subclavian vein, and brachiocephalic vein. Hence, the correct answer here is E, all of the above. An infusion catheter was placed across the subclavian vein in this patient, and much of the thrombus was subsequently lysed. In these cases, we generally like to avoid angioplasty and stent since the cause is actually extrinsic to the vessel. Um, the idea is to hopefully minimize any trauma to the vein itself. What's your best diagnosis? The best diagnosis in this case is popliteal artery aneurysm. 
Which of the following statements about popliteal artery aneurysms is true? The true statement here is B, occurs with aortic aneurysm in around 25% of cases. Popliteal arteries uh, may be called um, aneurysmal once the diameter is one and a half times normal diameter, and they occur bilaterally in around 60% of cases. True or false, chronic thrombosis is a more common manifestation of popliteal artery aneurysm than acute limb-threatening ischemia. The answer here is true. Um, acute limb-threatening is um, ischemia may occur in up to a third of patients compared to chronic thrombosis in about two-thirds of patients. What is the first-line therapy? First-line therapy for popliteal artery aneurysm includes surgical resection of the aneurysm and bypass graft, or thrombolysis, thrombolysis if no downstream touchdown site is available. Which of the following is the most common type of vasculitis in adults? The most common type of Vasculitis in adults is giant cell arteritis, which happens to be the diagnosis in this particular case. Provide at least three causes of segmental proximal arterial narrowing. So causes of segmental proximal arterial narrowing may include atherosclerosis, vasospasm, acute trauma, radiation arteritis, and takayasus, which... Um, as we've kind of mentioned here and in our last um, group, um, usually has a slightly more proximal involvement than seen with giant cell arteritis. Identify this vessel. This vessel is a replaced left hepatic artery. Embolization of a lateral segment left hepatic lobe tumor would require cannulation of which vessel in this patient? The answer here is the left gastric artery, which would provide access to this replaced right, um, left hepatic artery. Name this sign and its significance. This is called the floating viscera sign, and it is a indic it is um, an indicator of a possible aortic dissection. What we see here basically is a um, a pigtail catheter um, angiogram that's been uh, performed via the aorta. These are some angiogram images from slightly more upstream. All of the following are endovascular options for managing this disorder, except the answer here is C, thrombolysis. Endovascular options for managing um, a dissection like this, it would include angioplasty through the dissection flap, stent graft placement, and stenting of compromised branch vessels. Name at least two causes of perirenal hemorrhage in the absence of trauma. So three um, common causes of perirenal hemorrhage in the absence of trauma may include a bleeding renal AML, a bleeding RCC, or even a bleeding hepatocellular carcinoma, if we're talking about the, the right side. What's your best diagnosis in this case?
With these microaneurysms so near the renal capsule, a diagnosis of mycotic aneurysm must first be entertained until proven otherwise. Which of the following is true regarding mycotic renal aneurysms? The true statement here um, is A, renal aneurysms may occur near the capsule in this dose order. Um, what's also true is that mycotic aneurysms um, in the setting of endocarditis may occur at vessel bifurcations. What's your best diagnosis? The best diagnosis in this case is chronic venous insufficiency. Provide at least three post-thrombotic syndromes. Post-thrombotic syndromes include limb edema, aching, venous claudication, hyperpigmentation, and skin ulceration. Chronic venous insufficiency is usually caused by what? The cause of chronic venous insufficiency is usually recurrent DVT causing valvular damage that permits reflux into the superficial venous system. Which vessel is usually ablated during endovenous ablation for chronic venous insufficiency? The ablated vessel is usually the greater saphenous vein. Which statement about Doppler ultrasound after thermal ablation, a thermal greater saphenous vein ablation is true? Statement B is the true statement here. Thrombus extension into the femoral or popliteal veins may be observed. The greater saphenous vein will often be the same or modestly smaller early after thermal ablation. Deep venous thromboses in this population are relatively uncommon. And in patients with pain, the deep venous system should be evaluated. What's your best diagnosis? The best diagnosis in this case is fibromuscular dysplasia. Which subtype of FMD is most commonly mistaken for Takayasu's arteritis? The subtype of FMD most commonly mistaken for Takayasu's is intimal fibroplasia. Intimal fibroplasia can result in smooth focal stenosis or long tubular stenosis, the latter of which can mimic tachyoses. Medial fibroplasia, on the other hand, usually presents with multiple stenoses that appear as a string of beads. Which subtype of FMD is most common in carotid cases? The subset of FMD most common in carotid cases is medial dysplasia, which is a subtype of medial fibroplasia that accounts for 80% of renal cases and most carotid cases, um, specifically medial dysplasia. Um, this is a table we've just uh, provided just to kind of summarize that point. A filling defect is present within which structure? There is a filling defect within the cystic duct. What's your best diagnosis for this case?
The best diagnosis in this case is Maritzi syndrome, uh, common duct obstruction caused by extrinsic compression from an impacted stone in the cystic duct or sometimes the infundibulum of the gallbladder. Folks with Maritzi syndrome can present with jaundice, right upper quadrant pain, and fever. In this case, this was managed by interventional radiology with a percutaneous biliary drain. What's your most likely diagnosis? The most likely diagnosis in this case is SVC syndrome. The most common cause of SVC syndrome is The most common cause of SVC syndrome is intrathoracic malignancy. If SCC syndrome was secondary to bilateral brachiocephalic vein occlusion, stenting should extend only as inferiorly as So if we have a case of SCC syndrome due to bilateral brachiocephalic vein occlusion, stenting should extend only as inferior as just above the azygous inflow. There's a good chance the asgus may be part of some sort of collateral venous uh, drainage pathway that's active here, so you'd like to avoid jailing that with your stent if you could. Which of the following is an indication for ablation of a renal AML? So of the choices here, preventing future hemorrhage is probably the best indication for ablating a renal AML. Primary indication for um, treating AML is to decrease the risk of future hemorrhage. Um, we often though prefer heat-based ablation because of the associated cautery effect. Identify that structure. And this structure is a vessel, specifically the ureteral artery. What's the most common cause of a lower GI bleed? The most common cause of a lower GI bleed is diverticulosis. Which of the following is the endovascular therapy of choice in this particular case? In this particular case, the best answer is coil embolization. The idea is would be to decrease the arterial pressure head at that specific bleeding site so that the body's natural coagulation can stop the bleed. Particle embolization um, occurs um, basically too distal and can result in bowel ischemia and necrosis. Gel foam is a thick slurry that would need to be injected much more proximally and could compromise perfusion to a larger territory of normal bowel. Um, although vasopressin has been historically uh, used um, to manage large bowel bleeds, it is associated with a substantially higher complication rate than with embolization. Um, the major complication rates of vasopressin use in the setting may be up to 20%.